You're listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. Check, check, one, two. Look like a little country. Some rock and roll and blues. Cause we sure love playing for good people like you. Let me know if you can hear me Check, check, one, two Welcome to Music Local and Sustainable, the radio show that features discussions with and the music of local musicians. I am your host, Dave Lake. Tonight, I'm sitting around the piano with Kim Steiner. I discovered Kim Steiner at one of the cabarets. I was listening to the cabaret and I said... Wow, that piano player. Who is that piano player? I've never seen this piano player. I've got to talk to him. And that was Kim Steiner. (laughs) Welcome, Kim Steiner. Thank you. Thank you very much. What is the life of an accompanist like? Well, it's multifaceted. You have a lot of roles that you play. You are, of course, providing all the music for... A singer, if you're just if you're accompanying a singer, let's just speak to that because there's <laughs> different situations. But if you're accompanying a singer, you are the orchestra, so it's your job to recreate the orchestrations and then making sure that you are doing just as much or as little to make sure that you're supporting the singer as much as that he or she needs. Specifically, when I'm accompanying a singer, I'm always always listening to dynamics about phrasing everything just really honing in and trying to connect it's almost like a a soulful visceral connection and when you get there that's where the magic happens that's some part of it when you're accompanying other things like if you're in a band situation there's variety of things that you have to do you have to be aware of where the bass player is you have to be aware where the vocalist is if you're a person like me who's the musical director you also have to make sure it's all going very well and keeping it all together at the same time having to take care of yourself and what you're playing it's a fun position and it's a very challenging position and at the level that i'm playing now a lot of experience you need to to do it correct because you might be playing a jazz number for the first number and then you're doing a art song as the second number (laughs) and then you're doing a rock and roll song as the third number so you just have to have a lot of knowledge of genre and just a high level of okay we're doing rock how am I going to play this part okay now I'm playing Schubert how do I play the piano they're completely different techniques so it's just a, a wonderful multifaceted job being an accompanist it's really interesting when someone says, oh, last night I was out seeing da-da-da, and it's the vocalist. They never mention the accompanist. When you see the advertising, and it's the vocalist, luckily with <laughs> Kim Steiner and the small letters below it. Why do you think that that has been the case in terms of the hardest working person in music gets the smallest print? Because the the job of an accompanist isn't to be the attention getter. I mean, you know, people come to see Natasha Drina. People come to see Trey Gurley. They don't necessarily come to see me. And the role that we're playing isn't a supportive role. So it's good for me. And we'll say Trey Gurley, and I've been working a lot. People come to see him, and then now they're used to seeing me with him. Now... The thing is, is that accompanists are getting a lot more recognition these days. You see, especially with the TV business, is that almost every late night host and sometimes even daytime hosts, they have bands now, live bands. Someone figured out that that's a really great thing to have a live band instead of a DJ or piped in music. And you can see that these people who are usually served as accompanists, like John Batiste, who's with Stephen Colbert, he's getting a lot of focus. And that happened all the way back to Paul Schaefer. Paul Schaefer became an entity within the show. Well, it became an entity, I think, to most people. If you're into jazz, Jean Baptiste is a name you already know. And it's sort of like, oh, wow, he's going as a house band. It's sort of like, that's surprising. But in some cases, these people are already known in certain groups. 
In certain circles. Certain circles. Correct. But now that with the national thing is that now they're their entity under themselves, their household name, and they're a companist, basically, for the show. So anyways, to get back to the point is that, yes, now, and especially in Savannah, now that I've been playing out a lot more, people do come in to say, hey, Kim, how are you? And like yourself, I said, hey, Kim, you know, I've been dying to meet you. So it's been wonderful and starting to get recognized as a, as a musician here in, in Savannah. I've only been here for a short amount of time. So people are coming to see me who I play with, which is always nice. But again, that's not important to me. The important thing to me is to play with really, really, really good musicians. And there's a lot of great musicians around here. It's just been a wonderful experience so far. Now, what do you go through to shape your accompaniment to match the singer? For instance, you may have been working with certain singers. You've got a certain style that you work with them and very familiar with them. And um, the chord progressions you do are, are to meet their needs. And then you switch to another singer, doing the same song, now with another singer. What, do you, what goes through your mind? What things do you have to change? How do you have to adapt to the new singer? Concretely, when you go from singer to singer, as often you have to change keys. So when I'm playing with Trey, I'm playing in a certain key, which is more appropriate to him. He's a baritone tenor. When I play with Natasha Drina, she is a mezzo and sometimes a soprano. So keys are the first thing that's, that we have to change. But more importantly, they're all individual singers. So I'm listening to how they phrase. I'm listening to how they approach the song. Trey might want to do Night and Day as a bossa. Kim Pelote might want to do Night and Day as a ballad. Natasha might want to do Night and Day as a jazz swing thing. So it has to do with what I'm going to be doing as far as accompanying. What's the style? What's the key? And then most of it is just listening. Like I said before, trying to connect with that particular artist at an emotional level too. So, I mean, that's very basic, but those are a lot of things that I think about. Now, emotional level, how do you adapt to their emotional level? What, what things do you do? If there's a certain lyric and that singer is singing it with a lot of passion, what is it that I can do to accentuate or lay out like a, a color to make sure that everyone's feeling what the singer is saying or the way she's expressing it. And that has to do with really listening and what am I going to do? How, where, in the, where in the piano am I going to play? What's the dynamic that I'm playing? What's the chord? Am I going to make it big? Am I going to make it small? What can I do to support the singer? So what do you do when you, say, are working with a singer who wants to treat a song like a ballad. What do you do at the piano? So I'm thinking orchestrationally, I'm thinking, what should I play according to what the singer is singing? And how can I best support the phrasing, the, the intent, all that kind of thing? So if you don't mind, let's uh, do some playing, huh? I'll show you. It's better than me to talk. It's better me to play. So song, night and day. Do it as a ballad. Okay, so I hit the five chord. And that's where they would open up after the first initial verse. So you see I got a little bit more expansive. I started using more of the keyboard. Again, it's a lot of listening and interacting. Now, on the same thing, on the same song, in the same key, one of my friends would say, hey, you know what, I want to do this as a swing. Let's just swing it. So just with that much information, 
Let's swing it. Okay, and then a one, a two, a one, two, three. So you see now that's a little bit more aggressive and there's a different set of skills that you need to be able to do that. If you notice what I'm, my, my left hand, that's called a walking bass. If I don't have a bass player with me and I'm just playing solo with a, with a singer, I have to recreate the whole rhythm section. So you can see the, the left hand was the bass, but I'm also going a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So I'm accenting two and four, which is what the drummer would do. And then the right hand, I'm recreating whatever the horns or strings, the big band, or the piano player, the rhythm section, I'm doing it all at once. So once again, walking left hand, check this out. So I'm going. You can feel the time in there, right? That's the drummer, but so I'm doing two things at once. In the right hand, I'm doing orchestration. So that's just a little demonstration on how one song can be a multi amount of different things and the things that I'm thinking about when I'm, when I'm playing with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had then a bass player, you wouldn't have to necessarily do that walking bass. That would be provided by the bass player? When you were playing with a bass player, we're specifically trained pianists. Now we ought to do something different. The bass holds down the walking bass. While they're walking, they're providing the roots, the bottom of all the chords. So because it's such a low range that where the bass plays, if you try to do the same thing in the piano and you're not doing exactly the same thing at the same time, you're getting a clash and an awful distorted clash. It has to do with acoustics. So what we do, especially in jazz, you stay out of that bass area. And now you have a lot, for me, I'm like, great. I can orchestrate more now because I don't have to worry about the bottom. So let me show you a little bit about how I would play as if there was a bass player and a drummer. Right. Back to Night Day, let's just stick with that. It's really one of my favorite songs. So the, the bass player is going, now I'm up here. More orchestration up here. This is what the, the horns will be going. thing about us talking and people who are interested in what I'm doing, you can see that everything that I've done has a different color within one specific tune. And I'm doing different things for depending on what situation I'm in. And that's the challenge and that is also the joy of being an accompanist. And what are some of the things that you do to change that color? Well, speaking to color, I can play one chord literally in 3,000 different ways. So if it's like a D minor chord, I mean, I could play one note, I can play 10 notes, and I can, within D minor, I can add different colors to it. For instance, 
This is a D minor chord, just sitting by itself. Now, that's minor, so it's, it's a darker chord. Now, I can add the bass. Now, I can also add some color. In jazz, we call it a seven. So instead of D minor, now it's D minor seven. I can do this to it. That adds a different color. I can add a thing called a tension. So I can add extra notes to it. This is a D minor seven too. I can do it all the way up the keyboard and do something like this. I can add a flat five to it and make it darker. So there's a variety of different things. And then there's volume. So I can do. Or I can go. Or I can go. I can move it around. Often musicians will talk about an open chord and a closed chord. A closed chord is something that's really all close together. Okay? That's closed. Now all I can do is I can spread those four tones around and make it open. So again, how much do you want? How little is necessary? Things like that. So open, closed, yes. Arranging tricks. Tonight, I'm sitting around the piano with Kim Steiner. When you think about all those different features, what are the factors of the vocalist that make you change how you approach the tune? First of all, they, they usually call the key, and then they'll call the style. Or I will say, let's say, let's do night and day. I'll say, oh, how would you like to do it? And they'll say, oh, I like it as a bossa or I like it as a swing, or whatever. And then, then I'll say, so how fast would you like it? <laughs> and then with that, that information, I start, and for the first couple bars, I'm just doing as minimal as possible and listening to what the singer is throwing at me. And then once I kind of understand how they're phrasing it and what they want to do with it, then I just, I, I'll go off and, and create the compliment. Sometimes we'll just go in if it's somebody I know. It has to do with dynamics, it has to do with phrasing, it has to do with intent, it has to do with lyric. A whole bunch of things that you have to be uh, thinking about, and instantaneously. It's a, it's a very improvisatory thing, especially when we're talking about jazz and rock. And... Whereas if I'm doing Mozart or Schubert, it's very finite what's on that page. I have to play every note that's written, but I'm still intently listening to the singer because that singer might take this retard a little bit more. The only thing that's on the page is R-I-T, okay? So I'm listening, where is she putting the melody? And I have to, again, work with her intently. He or she is in charge, and I'm listening, and even though these notes are on the page, once again, trying to make the accompaniment as an arrangement around what the singer is giving. It, even with classical music, even though it's, again, very finite, this is what you need to play, what can I do to make the singer feel comfortable, and then accentuate the performance. Yeah, I had the opportunity to go to a vocal master class last week, and it's amazing how varied you can make a classic Schubert, mm -hmm. uh, the Trout, for instance. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing how much phrasing can make a difference in the song, even though when you think of classical music as these the specific notes and you play the specific notes and you split play it in the specific way, you play it the specific tempo, everything is well structured. How much variation due to the phrasing can be and where they take their breaths and how they think about the lyric, the, the actual words that are being spoken, the song as well as the way that they can modify that to maybe change some of the meaning or simply to make it easier for them to perform and how different it can be from vocalist to vocalist. Absolutely. And, and you would think in classical music, why do we have certain people that we listen to in classical music? Again, it goes back to the, we're human, we're all different. And no matter what piece of music, you have, and I wish you know, maybe the next time I talk with you is I'll have different singers, and we'll do one song, and we'll, you know, I won't 
they won't be in the same room and we'll bring them in and I'll have four singers sing the same song. You can see how different it can be, even in the same genre. And that's great. That goes back to us performing and musicians and how do we express ourselves? You know, we've talked about before about people coming and listening to us or people following us as artists. We're not so much concerned about the audience when we're at a high level. We're more concerned about what we're giving and how we're expressing ourselves. And that's where the high level of performance comes. Now, we're always aware and we always want the audience to enjoy and that's great. But when you're performing, you're thinking about the emotion and what you're creating. And, and to me, it's kind of weird when I'm accompanying when I'm performing, the audience goes away. I'm not a really, at times, even aware that they're there. Because I'm concentrating so much on what's going around me and how I'm interacting with that group and what kind of music we're making. And am I expressing my emotion? That's another thing that I really want to tell you as a companist or even as a musician, that the audience is so important because that's where we get our feedback from. But in the moment, we put you away for a while. And then you become back a parent when you give us your reaction. But even though sometimes when it's, I was at the edge of my seat, oh my God, they were, every note, I was listening to every note. We feel that. Because we feel it between us as the musicians. We feel that, oh my God, this is great. And then we also feel the, the audience almost sometimes breathe with us too. And that's also high level, but it's very exciting when, the, when you get that interaction. And I noticed you said you came to the cabarets. It's a very intimate setting. We put the audience on the stage and the musicians are on the lip of the stage, so you're very close. You can hear us breathe. We feel that a lot on that, and that's why it's such a special uh, project that we have here in Savannah. That's the way I think of cabaret, as being that very intimate environment where you're almost one with the musicians. And that's what's really exciting about cabaret in general. What is cabaret? Cabaret, to me, is just having an intimate setting where the audience is really close and the artist is really connecting with the audience. But what defines it? What genre is it? It's its own. In one cabaret, one performer could do a multitude of different styles. But then what it, the most important thing in the cabaret is the artist connecting with the audience and the audience connecting with the artist. And it's very special. We talked about this before, Dave, is that, you know, Savannah is a very special place. I think of it as a small town, a wonderful small town. There's some amazing musicians in this small town. And you go and you look at the paper or online, there is so much music going on in this town for a relatively small amount of people. I mean, you can understand in New York, I mean, if you've ever looked at the New York Times in the art section, there's no way to cover it all. There's just an immense amount of creativity going on there. Well, of course, there's 12 million people there. We're not close to 12 million. Maybe 1 million on St. Patrick's Day. That's the most. But it's just amazing when you open up the connector, the Savannah Morning News, and seeing, or online, especially online now, how much is going on. So this is one of the things I really love about Savannah, is that I think the, the live music scene here is cherished and supported. So that's uh, something that's really important. It was really interesting because in talking to some of the other local artists, you're starting to see certain communities are starting to really support local music and local musicians. When they try to bring in a musician from out of town, there isn't the same level of support as it would be for a local musician, which is good and bad because it's good for the local musician and that's what this show is all about, supporting the local musician. But some of these musicians that they bring in from the outside that don't get the turnout are just spectacular. I gotta say that now that I've been playing out more, the so local 
community supports the local musicians. And it, definitely it's not that case all over the place. And it's really super important because live music, as we know, at one point I was thinking it was a dying art form. And no matter what you say, I mean, seeing live music is something that it's indescribable. So I really love that we have that the live music down here in Savannah is so supported and, and adored. And the more I can do to sure that I do it, for the people on, who are listening to the show, um, I'm a professor at SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design. That's an all-involving job. We go very early in the morning to very late at night because I work in the performance arts department. So we teach, we all do our classes, and then at night we rehearse our shows, or we do rehearsals and we do performances. So it was really hard initially when I first moved down here to go play. Now that I'm just getting to know all the people in the music scene, I'm putting it in my schedule to make sure I play because I've realized that for me, and we go back to this performer, is that uh, it just fills me up when I get to perform. And it's the one thing I've been doing for 45 years, playing piano, so can't stop that. So it's really important and really awesome that Savannah has, has started to uh, recognize me and, um, and en enjoy my art, so that's great. In addition to the cabaret series, what chances do you have to perform out? Many, many. I play with a lot of the singers here. But we mentioned Trey. I, I, I work with Trey Gurley a lot. Uh, I work with Natasha Drina a lot with the cabaret. I play in different places. I'll play at Ruth's Chris. I do a brunch at the Oglethorpe Club. Then sometimes I just get together with a group of students and sometimes we go out and, and jam around town. Professionally, I've done things outside of Savannah. I produce and I arrange for a variety of different things. One thing that I'm working on right now is um, working with a pretty famous up-and-coming singer where she wants to do a Fleetwood Mac tribute with a symphony. So I'm starting to arrange Fleetwood Mac for the symphony. I'll play in different groups. Someone will call me and say, hey, Kim, I need you to come down and play for this jazz band, or I need this. I'm like, okay. As long as it fits my schedule, I do that. So I'm around a lot. Not as much as, as I would like, but uh, you'll see me almost everywhere. <laughs> matter of fact, you, Dave, you said, I've seen you now for a couple of years. I've been dying to meet you. I'm like, oh, well. Yeah, that's nice to be recognized. So, yeah, um, Kim Steiner, there's only, uh, I think, one guy named Kim in Savannah. So, uh, yeah, please, uh, whenever you see me, come and say hi. Now, let's talk about the variety of music that you do. It encompasses the whole range, as you said, from Schubert art songs to to jazz to standards to Broadway. Often, I think most people would think of musicians as being in a field. There's a classical musician. But you do so much. How do you switch from one genre to another? Like I said, I've been doing this for 45 years. And in these 45 years, I've done a lot of different genre. One of the first gigs I had when I was 16 is I would play in a church. I was a church organist. So I'd play church on Sundays, but on Friday and Saturdays, I'd go to Pittsburgh and play at the Shiloh Inn at the bar. And of course, I'm a classically trained musician. So there's the classical part, and then there's the contemporary part. My first degree was in classical performance. After I got done with that, I was like, I'm good, but I'm really not that good <laughs> to make a living. The classical world is so competitive. So I knew that I needed to get some more training. So then I went to Berklee College of Music in Boston. And there I learned all the modern genre, how to play chord changes, how to do jazz, how to play rock, how to arrange in modern music how do you write for a drum set? What the heck is a bass guitar doing? Getting that knowledge. And then when I was in Boston, I'd play in a jazz band. I'd play at Harvard Square a lot. That was the time when fusion, do you remember the, the musical genre fusion? The Weather Report and Michael Brecker, and I was playing in a couple fusion groups. And then I'd go play in a funk group. We'd go to Roxbury and play 
in an African American club, go out to Worcester and play this and that. So in the experience, I did all these different genres. And then after Boston, I moved to New York City and I did Broadway for about 15 years as a music director and a pianist. So all it is is just the experience of doing just about everything and being able to switch, knowing exactly what each genre needs. And even here at SCAD, I try to tell my students, you really need to know more than just one thing. If you love musical theater, that's great. Get to know it intimately. But also remember that you're going to have to sing a pop rock song sometime. So I need to teach you how to sing pop rock. Okay, now there's also art songs like Schubert and Mozart and that. You have to also learn how to sing classically too. That is one thing I think in this modern society, especially now that we're in the millennium. As a professional musician, and when I say musician, I'm also including singers as musicians, you have to know a multitude of genre. Everybody here in Savannah, I know, for instance, there's a great trumpet player named Robin Bouchamp, who's also a SCAD professor here. An amazing trumpet player. He'll play in the symphony, and then he'll go and play in a rock band. And then and I'll see him in a church with a brass quintet. And then I'll see him in a reggae band. Professional musicians, you have to be able to do multi-genre. Now, to specifically address your question, there is little boxes in my brain <laughs> where I have to access, oh, okay, musical theater, boink, okay, jazz, whole different set of skills. So that is a whole nother little area. You just go to that specific place where, oh, jazz, okay, these are my skills. And it's, and it's not conscious thought at this point, just like, oh, jazz, psh, and that's that part of the brain. Schubert, oh, haven't done that for a while. <laughs> and sometimes I'll even have to go home away from the audience and practice a little bit just to get refocused on that genre. So yeah, it's like a little switch. Uh, with, and knowing as a pianist what I have to do in these different genres. You're listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with global soul. If you enjoy our programming on WRUULP, please support the station with a donation. As an individual, you can give any amount, become a basic station member, or become a serious fan of the station. To check out membership rates and to donate to the station, go to www.wruu.org individual and select to donate monthly or subscribe to an annual membership. Again, to donate to the station, go to www.wruu.org individual and select to donate monthly or subscribe to an annual membership. Thank you for listening to and supporting WRUULP. Healthy Savannah is a social movement founded in 2007 to make Savannah a healthier place to live. The organization works to increase opportunities for citizens to engage in physical activity and consume a nutritious, balanced diet. Healthy Savannah is fueled by the ambitions and motivations of volunteers. Events around the community are always in need of a helping hand, whether it is a one-time basis or continuously. More information available at HealthySavannah.org. You're listening to Music Local and Sustainable, and I'm your host, Dave Lake. Tonight, I'm sitting around the piano with Kim Steiner. What are the different skills or what are the different tools, as you said, that you use for each of those that's unique to those? For instance, what are the characteristics of jazz that really distinguishes it from, say, Broadway musical numbers? Modern, or contemporary music as we call it, is very improvisatory. Meaning, you're creating it on the spot. And it, that just doesn't happen. I mean, again, it goes back to experience and a lot of time in the practice room. <laughs> when I'm conducting or I'm playing a Broadway show, every note is written like we talked about the classical music, every note is, you have to play those notes, but again, you're still reacting to the singer. Because this goes back to accompanying. People 
are not listening to the accompaniment. They're watching the singer on stage. And we are providing the emotion. We, as musicians and accompanists, we're adding to that. So within these different genre, there's certain things that I have to think about. Maybe I should play it, and I'll show you a few things. Here's a musical theater song. It's a Lawrence Hart and Richard Rogers song called Where or When. It was originally in a musical called Babes in Arms. And if I was playing this in a Broadway show, I'd be playing it like this. It's that sweeping Broadway style, right? But then, this is one of Trey's favorite songs, and mine too, I love this song. So, now I'm gonna play it in a, in a more of a jazz style. Let's swing it. Okay, cool. One, two, three, four. So you see like if you if you sing So I'm I'm again what we talked about before, I'm recreating the accompaniment in a jazz style as if I was Broadway. I'm just on the strings and I'm the orchestra. Let's say someone got real kooky and said, hey, let's make this a uh, rock song. What is necessary for the genre to recreate that genre on the piano? And what skills do you need? When I was playing the Broadway, I'm actually looking at the notes and playing the notes and, and thinking also orchestrationally, I know this musical very well, so what were they doing in the orchestra? Were the strings here? Were the woodwinds here? Where does the brass come in? And when you're looking at a Broadway sheet, you're looking at pretty much the piano part. So it's also the skills that I need are the knowledge of what the original orchestration is, and I'm trying to recreate that. When I swing it, I'm thinking about Sinatra and Nelson Riddle. And what would Nelson do? Where are the sax fills? Where are the horn punches? and trying to create it that way. The other thing I'm thinking about is the singer. When the singer is, hey, we should and talk, so talk like this before, there's a space in there. da 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 no, 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 where, or when, space, space. Two measures of space. What can I do to enhance that space and keep the energy moving? And then what do you have to do? Well, that's improvisatory. Where's that line? So that's, again, you're reacting to what Trey is giving you, and then you fill, and we just play and have fun. Um, and then with the rock, I'm thinking about the rhythm. What would the rhythm actually do? And you have to create that within the piano. Because the piano is not only a string instrument, it's also a percussion instrument. And people forget that. So as an accompanist, as a pianist, we're thinking in... And that's what's great about the piano. This is why I love that. Uh, with the piano, I mean, you really have the whole orchestra there. The one thing that amazes me, probably because my lack of experience, my lack of practice in it, I trained as a classical musician. Then when I would be called upon to be in the pit orchestra to do musicals, that was at the time when you started to see the rock musical for the first time. But you'd have a more classical musical, like a Rodgers and Hart. You'd have a musical such as Leonard Bernstein, which is really more jazz, jazz rhythms, and Latin rhythms were part of that. Then you had Hair, Tommy, and some of the rock, early rock musicals, where it would be straight rock beats. I had the hardest time with that, changing from from rhythmic structure to rhythmic structure to rhythmic structure. 
is that just practice or is or is it just talent to to be able to switch back and forth between all those i mean there's at least a million latin rhythms and <laughs> each right. are unique the million <laughs> right unique to a certain culture too yes yeah. and there's different things you can do within that particular genre of salsa so if it's a merengue there's variations within that in a basa there's different variations but and and so how how do you do that? How do you switch back and forth between those rhythmic structures so easily? I think you hit on it. It's not innate. When you're practicing, you often use a metronome. A metronome to your audience, it was a box that had that clicked. It went click, 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 click. And one of the tenets in the very beginning of music, that's called time. And that instrument was to teach, oh, we have to stay within this time. So that's the basics. I mean, if you're a drummer, you sit there, you sit with a metronome and you're just trying to keep your beat steady. The same thing in classical music when you're playing on the piano, you're trying to keep the beat steady. When you're playing cello, you are keeping the beat within the orchestra. You can't go off on your own unless you're like in a jazz orchestra. So within the classical structure, we have to work on dexterity on our instrument, but the time element. And the internal time is what makes a, a great musician and a, a not great musician. So it's practice, yes. But, like you said, if you're doing salsa, if you, you have to play time differently than if you were playing a Broadway tune. You have to play time differently with jazz than you do rock. It has to do with where the beats are in this microcosm of time. So classical is pretty much on the beat, and you're always pushing forward, where in Latin, it's behind the beat. So the, the beat is going, going dot, 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 dot. So everything is accented on the offbeat, which means, which pulls it back. When I talk to my drummers, I'm like, when I'm, when I'm conducting or when I'm, when I'm arranging or music directing, I'm like, no, 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 no. You're pushing that beat too far. You're too on top of the beat. Bring it back, relax that beat. Or, you're, you're dragging too much. Come on, get, get on top of it. So that's where time comes from. And you have to learn how the timing works within each genre. This goes back to the experience. And there's been many times I failed miserably <laughs> at it. And that's part of the whole learning process. I guess it seems like I make it kind of easy. So I can just switch this genre. I can go to this genre and I can go to that genre. It's a lot of work and a lot of experience for me to do that. And that's where people sometimes take it for granted. They're like, oh, yeah, just do this, just this, just, you know, okay. Well, I can't say, you don't understand what you just asked me to do. And I just do it. And that's one of the things that, especially to me, that I've been very successful in this career is because specifically, I may not be great at any one of those genres, but I'm good enough to get through all of them at, at a, a relatively high pace. I'm a Broadway geek. This is one of the reasons that I moved to New York. I just had to be part of it because I, from a very young age, always loved the Broadway as a genre. There were times when I would go to these, these musicals, and it still happens today, I get so moved that, it, not because it's happy or sad or whatever, it's just so unbelievable that I will be crying. I'm like, what is wrong with you? It's just so beautiful. I've seen some shows like Ragtime, the original cast, with Otter McDonald or Brian Stokes Mitchell. Oh my God, what a spectacle, huge. And I just remember like the end of the first act and just, of course, it's pretty tragic. Sarah dies. Um, so you're like just crying, but the sound was just amazing. And then, of course, the end and the little boy comes out. <laughs> I can't stand it. Same thing. I saw the original Sunday in the Park with George. When, that, when, the, when, it, when the painting comes in and everyone recreates, it's just one of the most moving things. Oh my god. 
So it just goes back to that. And that's just the magic of, of live music. No matter what everybody says, live music is never going anywhere. It has completely changed. Record companies are, are not as what they used to be. Record companies would give us what they thought was good and we had to take it. And they controlled a lot of it. Now, with the internet, they don't have as much control. So now we have all, you could literally listen to anything. Um, so that's not so much an issue anymore. But what has never changed is that live music has never stopped. People need it, music. It's a need. And the more that people connect with live music, such as yourself, I can tell you're such an avid music lover, it really is a necessary thing to keep you happy. It's so cathartic seeing a great performance, isn't it? Live music, great. The one thing else I wanted to address, which is really nice, is when you do do a performance, and you are lucky enough, I think it as a lucky thing, where the audience has moved enough to give you a standing ovation. There isn't a drug out there that could be more addictive. It's something that we aspire to. At me, at this point in my life, it's like, it's great if you get it. If you don't, that's fine, because I gave what I gave. But when you do get it, it is something very, very, very special. All the tingles happen. One of the shows I did in New York was a show called I Love You, You're Perfect, Not Change. I did that for eight years. And it's four people on stage and a piano with me and a violinist. That's it. Unbelievably well written, unbelievably well composed. Eight shows a week. It's, it's tough. But one of the things that keeps you through it is you know that the show is good. You know that your performance is good. You know that your cast is good. That keeps you going because of the audience reactions. And of course, performing, but it gets to a point sometimes where you're going 10, 12 hours a day and uh, you get exhausted. But I'm telling you, man, once I get behind a piano, it, all the vicissitudes. <laughs> uh, Carol Channing, I, I conducted for Carol Channing, she used to say vicissitudes. A very good word. Oh, the vicissitudes and your vicissitudes. All that goes away when you're performing. Maybe I'll play something. Let's see. Let's see if you know this one. Yes, my love for Gershwin is here to stay. <laughs> Wonderful. Isn't that a great song? The melody, it doesn't start on a, what we call the one chord. It starts on a two chord dominant. It's very clear, our love is here to stay. Then we finally get to the, the one chord. But it keeps you, from the very get-go, it just lifts you. Now explain, one chord, two chord. You said five chord earlier. Uh, okay. Within a scale, there's eight notes. There's the first note, the second note, the third note, the fourth note, the fifth note, the sixth note, the seventh note, and the eight repeats. Within that scale, you can build a chord. So, so in key of C, major scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you guys remember solfeggio and you the sound of music, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Each one of those has a number. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and it repeats eight. On each of those notes, you can build a chord, which is three notes stacked on top of each other, usually in thirds. So on the first chord, I put this note, I put this note, and this note together 
and that's based off of the first note of the scale. We call that the one chord. Then the second, here's the second, second note of the scale. We build it in thirds. That's called the two chord because it's built off the second degree of the scale, etc., etc., all the way through. Now, when I say five chord, five chord is that one chord I can go. You and your head have to finish that because it has so much tension you need to hear. And that's, it would always drive people crazy when I would go. And walk away. Everyone's like, no, 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 play the one chord. So anyways, going back to that, and I don't want to get too complicated with a the music theory lesson, but oftentimes the, the music starts on the one chord and ends on the one chord. That's the root of the key. Of the key, right. Gershwin didn't like to use the one chord at the very outset, just to create the forward momentum throughout the tune. So just that's why I, I love Gershwin. And I've noticed there's a lot of contemporary composers, singer-songwriters, we'll mm -hmm. use singer-songwriters as a group, very often they'll end not on the dominant. They'll, they'll not end on the one chord. You, you wonder if you could clap or scream or wait until the end of the song. Is it done? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's becoming much more, even in pop and rock music, of not ending on that one chord with a big button so we all know where it ends. Uh, and I think a lot of times what they do, and co correctly, is they want the feeling of it not ending, something unresolved. And a good singer-songwriter fits the melody and the harmony to the lyric. So if the lyric is maybe someday, and you end on not the one chord, and it just hangs there, how nice. That adds to the emotion and, and taking us on this journey. So they're doing it a lot more now, which is really quite nice. Jazzers have been doing this forever. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know uh, Thelonious Monk, John Coltrane. These guys who took jazz to, to the new, more, more modern level, post-bebop era. Just some amazing stuff they're doing, as far as harmony goes. So there was one thing I played where Within one chord change, I can play literally like 20 chords, 20 different ways of doing that. And you'll hear that if you ever listen to Coltrane. It, and it just expands the whole harmonic knowledge. Now it becomes something completely different. So yeah, it's very exciting. But, you know, the problem is, is that to learn all this stuff, it gets very dry. Like I was, I was thinking, oh my God, this is dry. Here's a one, here's the two, here's the three. That, that's music theory, but you know, if, once you see how it affects the music, it becomes very exciting. And then you can start to hear it. One of the best things about this show has been, I've learned so much about individual musicians and individual instruments and how they play a role in the bigger picture. And it helps me understand the music better and enjoy the music so much better. I like to think through the music too and, and sort of see how they're doing something and understanding the music and understanding what the arranger is trying to do or the composer is trying to do. Yeah, yeah. I, I sometimes forget. And when you first approached me to do the show, I was a, a little taken aback because it's been a long time since someone said, wow, you know, oh, you're that accompanist. You, wow, I really love what you do. It's like, oh, I guess people do listen. But to that end, the more you know about music, the more exciting it, it can become because you see the ultimate co complexities of what music is. When you're in a bar and you're having a drink and there's a piano player playing, you know, Phantom of the Opera, there's a lot going on there. Now, not that you have to like sit there and analyze <laughs> the piano player. I'm saying, but there's a lot that people can do if they are, and they want to start analyzing, if they're music lovers, what you can do. Here's one of the things I was thinking of, and I forgot to mention it. it, it it's so easy now, because we have the internet. What you should do is find one of, your, one of the songs that you really enjoy, okay? And go to this wonderful website called YouTube. This is what I want you all to do if, if you have the time. Pick one of your favorite songs. Doesn't matter, 
what genre? Type it in. Hit search. If it's a popular song, you're going to get a huge list of artists. What I want you to do, this is going to be a lot of fun, just click on one and listen to it. And then the same song, click the next one down. And the same one, click the next one down. And do that until you, I don't want to hear that song anywhere. But you'll start seeing the complexities and how, even though it's the same song, it can be done literally never the same. And that's the magic with music, is even if you're like what we talked about Schubert or Mozart or Rachmaninoff, even though those notes are supposed to be this way and in this time, it's never the same. So when you are listening to someone live, that is one instant of time that you will never be able to create, recreate unless you have it recorded. So that goes into the speciality of live music too. One of the things at WRUU in the music side of the house is we like to do different things. We have a rockabilly show, for instance. But also we will, as hosts of shows, we will do things that you would never hear on commercial radio. For instance, you mentioned playing the same song again and again with different artists. This morning on our morning show, the host played Hound Dog with two different uh, artists. And I'm sure we could have found a third or fourth from our collection. And we do that considerably more than you'd ever hear it anywhere else. Again, because of that contrast and the way it's being presented. I have a live show that I do called Eating Eclectic. I'll sometimes do that through different genres. I'll take the straight rock and then we'll do a, a jazz version of it. Of the same song. Of the same song. For just that reason, that exploring how music can be so varied based upon the particular style that's being applied or the musician that's doing it. It can be rock. It could be blues, but two different bluesmen doing the same song, so different, so unique. So completely different. And then if you follow an artist, one night that musician will do it this way, and the next night the musician will, the same musician will do it completely different. That's another one that happens too. You won't get the same performance. Again, that was going back to my previous point. And also when you, when you see different genre, and you do it that way, you will see like, wow, that affects me in a different way. This affects me this way. It's almost like colors of a palette. I love the eclectic radio show where you're not stuck to one genre. And I would love to tune in a lot more to you and see what, you th throw, what you're throwing at us because it's just good. I really hate sometimes to be when I'm driving on one station. I'm really bad with that. Because again, they're playing almost the same thing, especially once we get into like top 40. Just after a while, it just, you're hearing the same song, you're hearing the same type of beats. That's why I'm always hitting the button. So, and I would suggest for people who sometimes are like, eh, you know, uh, I'm just, I'm not kind of sick of this song. Go outside, like listen to your show, or just go to a different radio station. You'll hear a gospel radio show. You'll hear a rockabilly show. You'll hear classic rock. You'll hear classical if you get down in the 80s and jazz. Um, and just like sit and listen to it for a while and see what you think about it. And then if you do enjoy it, well then do some research and, and you can open up like a whole new world of something for that. It's almost like a Christmas present if you're a music enthusiast. I can't tell you how costly it is to go out to live music particularly if it's a genre you're not familiar with. You may not pay anything at the bar, but then you head right to iTunes. Either download that artist or download some of those songs so that you can listen again and again to uh, different versions of them and, and explore it. So th there, there is a downside to being a music club. Poverty. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think about that too as an artist. As artists, there's very few of us who are wealthy. I mean, we're wealthy as, not monetarily, we're wealthy in, in a lot of other ways. But I do notice that when we do talk about live music, and I'm glad you brought this point up, is that it can be really expensive. You go to a bar, 
and you pay for a couple of drinks and a meal and you're listening to an artist, it gets expensive. And then you love that artist and you buy the album. <laughs> even when I was doing Broadway, I mean, I was just, and even when I would go, let's say you have a date, so you have some dinner, you have some drinks, you go to a show, you go home, $500 is gone out of your bank account. It's very expensive. But at the same time, I think it's very fulfilling to do that. And you don't always have to pay a lot of money. It, and I want to go back to Savannah. There is a lot that you can do here for free. I did this wonderful, wonderful concert with Kim Pelote last Christmas in the Episcopal Church here in Savannah. Oh my gosh, we had an a cappella choir, we had a brass quintet, Kim and I did a couple gospel songs. The Savannah Children's Choir sang, you could have walked in there and not paid a cent. And it was one of the best concerts I'd been involved with here in Savannah. It was amazing. Now again, it was for a, a cause, a donation, but the churches around here are amazing. They do a lot of, of co free concerts. Um, we talked about Jared Hall, another uh, uh, musician here in, in Savannah. He does a concert series at the church that he works at. All the churches have from classical all the way to jazz. So that's one place. And then of course, you know, the, all the outdoor concerts that we do, I mean, it doesn't cost you anything to get a bottle of wine and sit in Forsyth Park and listen to the symphony for free under the stars. So again, not preaching, but if you can, please go and support the live musicians here in Savannah. There's just so much to do. You'll be better for it, I promise you. I can guarantee you, you'll be better for it. It's been a wonderful time talking with you. I just have enjoyed it so much. We've been talking with Kim Steiner tonight, and I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this. Me it's too. Wonderful. It's been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful conversation. And I'm sure we'll be doing this again. Oh, yes, sir. This has been another edition of Music Local and Sustainable, and I've been your host, Dave Lake. Save this time for another show next week. Well, I know we ain't headed for the Hall of Fame. We're gonna give it what we got, man, that ain't no shame. Let me know if you can hear me. Check, check, one, two. Let me know if you can hear me. Check, check, one, two.